Hi, I'm Edward Samuelson, and welcome to The Cinephiles, the show that allows you to eavesdrop on the conversation of fellow film fanatics. Today, we're going to be talking about the Hannibal Lecter series. We got quite a few requests for it on the Facebook discussion wall. Since I'm mentioning the Facebook discussion wall, we hope that you'll sign up and join it. Also hope that you'll subscribe to the YouTube channel. And we also hope you'll check out us at our new Twitter account, which Eric... Hashtag The Cinephiles TV. That's all you have to know. Hashtag The Cinephiles TV. And unfinished bit... Uh, no, unfinished B1. Jeff! <laughs> Jeff Galishaw! Jeff. Oh, yes, I just flew in uh, for this episode. So just because, you know... Boy, are your arms tired. Modern technology no. being, being <laughs> what it is, I thought it'd be a lot of fun to do this. But just before... Uh, we faded in. We just got two update. We got two responses to. I, I just posted an announcement that Jeff was here, and we shot a the Palma episode. S Stephen Harris, thank you. You thought we hated the Palma. Well, you might be wrong about that, buddy. Yeah, you, you have to watch the show. Wrong. Watch the show. You just might be wrong. Well, let's begin with the the uh, the Hannibal Lecter series. Of course, let's let's begin the origin. Thomas Harris was a writer uh, for a newspaper, and uh, he became an author. He wrote uh, a book called Black Sunday, not the Mario Bava film, that became a pretty uh, big, very good movie, very good movie, big bomb. But it was a very big bestseller. Robert and Charles. his, I like Black Sunday a lot. Um, and after that, he wrote uh, the first of many books uh, in the Hannibal Lecter series. He's only written a few books, but all of them were Han the Hannibal Lecter related. The book, the first book in the series, was a movie, or a book called Red Dragon, which was made into a film called Man, Man, Hunter, Man Hunter with my, by uh, Michael Mann. Michael Mann. Michael Mann. Uh, it was t it was titled uh, Man Hunter because. Dino De Laurentiis, the producer, made a film earlier called Year the Dragon, which was a huge flop. So he said, I don't want to call this Red Dragon. No fucking dragons in title! Uh, uh, Manhunter, I was a big fan of both the novels before the movies came out, actually. Uh, and when Manhunter came out, I didn't know Manhunter was Red Dragon. I had no idea until I started watching. It's like, this is Red Dragon. I read this book. I was so excited. The film when I saw it really feels like an R-rated version of Miami Vice with a serial killer. Uh, I I have to disagree greatly. I saw this for the first time Sunday, and I will admit, the serial killer element, you know, the way, when he's dressed up as the Red Dragon is a little ridiculous. But I love this movie more than I actually thought I would. And it's amazing because my friends who have seen this all, like, kind of hold it down here. I'll admit, Hannibal Lecter isn't featured as much as he is in the later remake called Red Dragon. But well, he's actually in a novel. He's a very Hunter, yeah. That's That's how, how much he's in it. Oh, just he's, that? That's it. Yeah, yeah, they built up his character for but see, I like. But see, I liked it in this Brian film. Brian Cox, man. It, with just like the five minutes of screen time he has, he just uh, he's amazing. As a Hannibal totally Lecter. different take than Anthony. Ama Hopkins. Totally different take, but he's amazing, amazing. I love Manhunter. I like Manhunter. I like Manhunter, Manhunter, but the problem I have with is it's is because of some of the '80s choices at the time. Because the only thing it's missing is I can feel it coming no, in the air I, I tonight. I, I, I can I see where you're, what you're coming saying, from. but I think his approach to the subject matter is absolutely fascinating, and I think that. It's like I mean we're going to talk about Red Dragon later, but I miss Tom Noonan. I you know seeing Tom like Noonan Rams, is awesome. I miss awesome. Tom Noonan. I miss uh, Stephen Lang. Stephen Lang. I Joan miss Allen. what's her name, Joan Allen. I miss all these people that weren't famous at the time. You know I, I miss their takes on those parts, even though they got a great cast of people to be in the remake or the other adaptation. I miss all these guys more. I, I do like William Peterson's performance quite a bit. In fact, I think this is why he got CSI. I mean, this is, this is there's no way, doubt in my mind this is the reason why he got CSI is because of this film. Well, like, mm -hmm. they must have remembered because like, CSI didn't come out to life. Well, well, I mean, he's playing a very Hunter. similar role. Oh, you didn't mention Dennis Farina. Dennis Farina. Mm -hmm. Dennis Farina, who is very good at also. Every, all the performances are good. It's just my problem is, is the A stylistic choices. However, I think the story is phenomenal, and Tom Noonan is genuinely very, very, very disturbing in this disturbing, role. Disturbing, but very sympathetic at the same time. Um, and I disagree with you entirely. I, I understand 
you're concerned with the dated 80s kind of feeling to it. It does feel like, you know, this was directed by the guy who brought you Miami Vice. It does feel like that. I grant you that. But I think his approach to it is far more chilling. And far more interesting than Brett Ratner's work. Well, that, hey, far dude. Far more interesting. <laughs> I'm going to look at the camera. What? No shit. We're talking and about Brett Ratner. I know we're going to talk Ratner. about later. I do we'll think get Red later. Dragon, ironically, is maybe Brett Ratner's best film, technically. But yeah. it's still just an open. Yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll get it. We've got to save room for that. What, what, and also, I want to credit to the cinematography, even though it's, like I said, a little dated. It's by Dan, Dante Spinotti, Spinotti, who would go on again and make Red Dragon years later. We'll talk about that a little bit more. The reason we're talking about this entire series is because of Hannibal Lecter. And in this film, he plays a very small role. Brian uh, Cox doesn't have much screen time, but he really makes the perfect use he of it. He makes an impression. He makes the most out of it. And it's a very interesting... Have. It's very antithetical to, to what... It's, it's, it's almost... He, he approaches it in an entirely opposite way than... than um, Hopkins would. Yeah, yes. because cause Hopkins really lays on thick, the lizardly, you know, the, you know, kind of slithering kind of kind of like psycho killer. And Hopkins is great. I, I, I like Hopkins' role as well. But Cox does this totally, like, charming I'm your friend I can be your friend well, how are you doing today Will how are you doing today please sit down and and, and because of his uh, the character Will Graham Agent Will Graham had had his brush with Hannibal Lecter which and scarred him you know, yeah. he's very wary of him and knows not to fall for this like you know and it's an interesting e even though he originated the role seeing a different take on the role which is what fascinated me Manhunter came out in 86 it was through Dino De Laurentiis's theatrical company called DEG and they were losing a lot of money, so they went bankrupt, and that's why the film kind of disappeared without a trace. Well, in the 1990s, um, Orion Pictures... Noah Dragon! I know, that's my attempt to do a really good cool Okay. okay. <laughs> Noah Dragon! By the way... I'm still working on the Travolta. By the way, by the way, when this was released on television after the su success of uh, Silence of the Lambs, it was actually called Red Dragon. Believe it or not, it was retitled for television. But anyway, in 1990... Uh, or it was called The Curse of Hannibal Lecter, Red that was like the full title. Yeah. Like the that sounds like the a TV movie. Lecter. Because it's like, oh, who gives a shit about Ham Anton? Oh, Sansa right. Lambs, let's tie it in there. Yeah. Well, anyway, back in the early, let's just say the late 80s, early 90s, Orion Pictures acquired the rights to the novel, and they went to Dino De Laurentiis and asked for permission to use the character names because he owned them. And he and since Red Dragon, or sorry, Manhunter was such a flop, he gave them the okay for it. Now, you guys might not believe this, but do you know who was originally uh, offered Sansa Lambs to, to, to star and direct in it. Uh, Gene Hackman. That is very true. I, I knew that. Gene Hackman right. was the original choice, and you know what? I couldn't, I couldn't spit it out. And he was talked uh, out of it somehow. You know what? He would have been. He would. It would have been very interesting. I have to say to see him take on the character. But <laughs> things as they things happen, and Jonathan Demme, fresh off married from the mob. There's no reason why he can do. I mean, the thing I understand, Anthony Hopkins is so indelibly etched as as. as that character. If you actually read the books before you see the movies, it's like anybody could play that part, really. And so I, I could totally see Gene Hackman doing that, doing his own stamp on that, just like Brian Cox did his own stamp. In fact, I remember when uh, Science Link, uh, the novel came out, and I, I was a fan of obviously Red Dragon and Dust Manhunter. I was excited that that came out and read that, knowing that it was sort of a pseudo sequel. Um, and, and reading it, I was like, and it was funny in my mind. I was like, I see Anthony Hopkins playing this part. And I knew who you know, Anthony Hopkins wasn't a big star at the time, but he was well known through magic and other stuff that he had done. He was a big stage actor. But he, I was like, I totally see him playing this part. He was a well respected character actor. He was not a leading man at that time, really. I mean, he did leading roles, but he wasn't, he wasn't, well, he well, wouldn't Science get people to the Lands got him his Oscar nomination. Yes. And, and, his his, and his Oscar. And his Oscar. And his Oscar. And he got the Oscar. His well, one Oscar. Well, let's give credit, though. This film is uh, was the first horror film, and I don't care. Some people say, oh, it's a thriller. No, it's a horror film. The first horror film to win Best Picture. And it's it, it's been lampooned, parried was, many times. Was uh, the Frederick March... I, I, I might be wrong about this, but wasn't Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde nominated for Best Picture? Well, I don't know if... I don't, wasn't Frederick Mark nominated for Best Actor? Well, I'm saying to win, the first one ever to win. This is the first genre picture ever to win, and True. Uh, it's it's a terrific movie from start to finish, and the, the, the genius in the film is the casting which, of Anthony Hopkins and Jodie Foster. Foster. And what makes it, makes it work for me so well is the cat and mouse between the two characters. Do you remember what film came out the same year that won the Golden Globes? No, I can't say no. that. Prince of Tides. Oh, oh, God, yeah. That's... Prince of Tides. And they're saying, well, Prince of Tides probably won the Oscar. And I was like, oh, please don't. And 
as we well know, uh, did, 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 Thank did, did, did Science and Lance pretty much sweep the Oscars? Because yes, yeah. it did. It was the first film since One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest to win Best Director, Best Picture, Best Actor, Best Actress, and Best Screenplay. And if you notice, most of uh, Jodie Foster's scenes are all done in close-up, and she was very nervous about having all her scenes done in close-up because she knew she'd have to be more emotional because the camera wouldn't be cutting away while she's getting dialogue from Anthony Hopkins. Now, one of the reasons I know that is because in high school, I was obsessed with this film and with the character. I even read the book, Silence of the Lambs, and I, this was one of my favorite movies. It's still, I would say, in my top 100, but I loved this movie in high school. I so w loved the character of Hannibal Lecter to the point it was scary. And I loved this film. For a while there, Jodie Foster was my favorite actress, and Jonathan Demme was my Demi, favorite. Demi. Jo Jonathan Demme, sorry, was one of my favorite directors. Then I saw other films, eventually. Well, <laughs> well, I will say this. After I saw this film, I, had, I, I, I will say this is uh, uh, one of the best female performances I've ever seen. I mean, I think Jodie Foster is phenomenal in this movie. Because the pro cause in this movie, she could have been so easily overshadowed by Anthony she, Hopkins. She's fantastic in it. She holds Everybody's her own. Fantastic. It's just interesting. You compare it to something like Manhunter and how Michael Mann not only approached the style of that film, but how he approached the casting choices. Because Dennis uh, Scott Glenn plays the Dennis Farina character. He plays that same FBI character. And differently. But an entirely different approach to that character in Science of the Land. I forgot his name was Jack something. Uh, Jack Crawford. Jack Crawford, that's right. He's playing the same character. And the uh, third the act. The thing we, we, had, we haven't mentioned yet, I, I, I love Silence of the Lambs too. I think it's a film that people, because it was so popular and it got all those accolades, people tend to get sick of it after a while and the whole That's what happened to me. thing. That's what happened to me. But it's really a good, very good film, very well made film. Jonathan Demi does a fantastic job directing that film. Especially the third it's act. It's a very well across the board acted film. Ted Levine. Um, Ted Levine, that, that brought him to, the, to national attention. And, uh, but I was gonna say, a lot of people don't realize this, unless those who have read the book, but it's a very faithful adaptation of the book. It's it's about the most faithful adaptation I've ever seen on screen. The only other movie I could think of that could be as faithful is Rosemary's Baby, but this is as close as it gets to the original source text as you can get. Um, I, I I also, I, I what I love about this film is, as you said, that, you know, the, the, the Hannibal, you know what's funny, is that Anthony Hopkins does not have as much screen time as you think he does in the movie. He doesn't. He, I mean, I, I forget how much it was. He has a lot more, though, than But yeah, he has a lot more yeah, than Brian Cox does. And he does have this, he, he's in it. Well, there was a lot, that was one people were complaining like he shouldn't be nominated for Best Actor because he wasn't in the movie enough, mm -hmm. but I, I'm sorry. He was so towering, I, I consider him actor in this movie because he was acting. And, and, and they it, keep him in the basement, and so when you're going to see him, it's like descending into hell. Yeah, I mean, in fact, that's one thing that uh, Jonathan Demme talked about is that when you go in the basement, Tak Fujimoto, who's the film, who's the well, cinematographer. That's, that's actually a famous thing. Yeah. I mean, they, they've all the, the talked red. about how it's all about. It's like you're following it to hell. And the whole idea is, is that as they're going past hell, past hell, past hell, and it's just like he just appears as if he's anticipating. Well, they said, no, no, he's a red. He said that he put all, when you see her going to cell, it becomes very red because that means this, this violence is coming up. I guess it's oh. kind of like what Francis Ford Coppola and the oranges, you know, in The Godfather. When oranges appear, someone gets killed. Um, and what I love about it is the mystery. The mystery works really, really well. It, it's never too clever for its own good, which I like, because some movies think they're so clever. You know, like the, the scene of, uh, of them, you know, of finding out where the moths come from or what leads her to Jamie Gum's house. Um, and Ted Levine, let's, uh, you know what's so sad is that he sometimes gets forgotten about because, you know, Anthony Hopkins is this very evil character who, yeah, I mean. He creates a disturbing character all his own. Yes. Unpainted horses. Buffalo Bill. Buffalo and, Bill. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. It's, it's definitely one of the best films of the 90s. I would say it's, it's Jonathan Demme's best film. And that film. last scene, with the night vision goggles. Scene, that's an yes. amazingly mm. well-directed scene, and it's suspenseful as hell. It's a scary scene. Definitely Jonathan Demme's best film. Would you agree with me? I don't know if it's best film. He's done some pretty good films. Yeah, I was He's done some say. pretty good films. I would say it's up there as one of his best. Yeah, I, I agree. Would what would you say his best film is done? Uh, oh, it depends. Melvin I mean, and Howard? Making Sense is a great documentary. That's one of the best documentaries on. Well, I love talking heads. I, I like band. more of his comedic work, but uh, that's me. And <laughs> also, I love Married to the Mob. Exactly. Um, mm. I think that's a very good film. Something Wild. Something Wild is very mm. good. Yeah. Um, great soundtrack. It's an unusual film, though, in his filmography, because it's a very dark film, because his films are more, a little bit more lighthearted. Well, no. Except, well, not, well, well Something Wild this is This is the not. irony about, about, about the whole thing. With, with Jonathan Demme, this is, 
he was going back to his roots with that film, his, his Roger Corman stuff. Hey, no, I love that stuff. That's what he was essentially doing. And, and, it's, and actually, I would say, up to that point, that was probably his most commercial film. True. If you wanted yeah. to find a commercial film within the career of Jonathan Demme at the time. Because all this stuff at that point was very quirky and edgy and, you know, you know just, just offbeat stuff. This was a very commercial, very straightforward thriller. It just happened to be very well done. Dito De Laurentiis decided that he wanted to make a sequel. Well, he went to the original writer, Thomas Harris, and, and commissioned him to write a sequel to Sansa Lambs. Well, it took a long time because for years and years and years went by, and it took finally 10 years before a sequel came out, and this book was called Hannibal, which focused on the and title apparently character. apparently Harris did not want to write this at all. He was just doing it for the money. That's what I understand, and that's why it took him so long to do it, because he just so was not into doing yet another Hannibal. And, and what's so funny is that my friend, who's a professional writer, he said, when you look at the book, it looks like it's written by different people, because he said the style is not consistent, and it really is a From mess. From what I heard, and I'm not sure how I heard this, and I could be totally wrong, but I understand that Harris intentionally did something. He wanted it to be awful because that would put the end to any more Hannibal Lecter stuff. All of them had problems with the script because they didn't like w where it went. In fact, Jodie Foster said she felt it was betrayal of her character was what she used and thought it was too, and Jonathan Demme, I believe, said it was too violent. So, uh, Dio De Laurentiis, I will do my terrible Italian impression, goes, when the Pope die, you get the new Pope. Oh, we elect right. the new Pope. <laughs> That was his. That was his. Uh, Thank you, Father Guido Salducci. Uh, well, yeah, Junior. You get the new. Uh, uh, the Italians are gonna hate us. Well, I, I, you know, but that's what he said. So, so he went to Ridley Scott. We've lost the gay boat. Now we're gonna lose the Italian boat. Hey. <laughs> Seriously, man. Hey, we got the Jersey Shore out there, but no. So anyway, he went to Ridley Scott, who just came, who was just, who did not, who glad, who just made Gladiator. It was not released yet, but it was just about to come out. And they hired Ridley Scott, a pretty good choice. And they got mm -hmm. uh, Steve Zalian who's, and David Mamet. Now, those are two very good writers <laughs> to tackle the script. And they cast Julianne Moore in Jodie Foster's role. Well, the problem with this film, and I think you guys can agree with me, is the original source material. Because the original book is not very good. And very it makes book. even worse of a movie. Is... Well, what's, what's, what, what, what does have going forward is it's nice to see Anthony Hopkins again. The problem is, is that... What I love so much about the original Sons of the Lambs is that Hannibal Lecter was kept in the shadows. Mm -hmm. You know, he was more of a menace, you know, a creeping there. When he's out front and center, you lose that suspense. Well, this is my thought. I mean, Hannibal the movie is, 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 is the quintessential guilty pleasure, though. I mean, that's basically what it is. And, and you know how, like, we, we, guys, we, we also taped tonight an, an episode on uh, selected Brian De Palma thrillers. Well, this is like the Raising Cain of Hannibal Lecter stories. You know, it's like the book, apparently Harris absolutely hated returning to that character. He didn't want to do it. He just did it for the money. So he did everything in his power to say, this is the, this is absolutely the last, the parody of a parody, blah, blah, blah. This puts the end into uh, Hannibal Lecter. And it shows. It's a grand, it's like classic Grand Gounod, overly melodramatic. It's the complete opposite from Silence of the Lamb or even like the original book, Red Dragon. It's not a boring film. No, no it's no, not. No, no, it's no, a no, really no. entertaining movie. You know, Gary Oldman. <laughs> very, very entertaining performance. Well, it's like watching a macabre superhero film because there's the scene where, you know, he has all these cannibal pigs, which is I love just, the macabre superhero it's, illusion. It's That's just, awesome. It's just such, uh, so ridiculous. Like, Gary Oldman's the supervillain. He has him in this pit with these cannibal pigs. And then when he escapes and releases, the pigs part as Anthony Hopkins walks out. And it's like, this makes no kind of sense. He just has all these otherworldly powers almost. And it's so ridiculous. And there's only really three scenes that really are just so memorable because they're so over-the-top ridiculous. The opening shootout scene with Julianne Moore and Hazel Goodman as this transsexual, AIDS-inflicted drug dealer. Just saying that sentence alone shows you how ridiculous this movie is. And then the Ray Liotta eat it, eating yeah. Ray Liotta's brains. I gotta say that at the end of the near the end of the movie. Gives yeah. new meaning to eating your liver with fava beans. But it is such an entertaining scene. It's disgusting, funny, and, and macabre all at the same time, as is Julianne Moore's ridiculous accent throughout the she film. She is absolutely dreadful. As Eric said, it's more of a guilty pleasure. I mean, I wouldn't go out of my way to watch it again, but if it's on, I'll probably sit through it. 
Well, like I said, I like Ridley Scott. I think he's the right when he's he's the right director for certain projects, mm -hmm. and some projects he's not. This is not one that I would really think would be for him. Why? Um, Why for this one? Because you don't think because I, I, it's a it, it's what it's meant to be, high camp, whatever, and Ridley Scott delivered on that. So like like. I don't know. I don't, I the think way the source material went, the way the script was written, and this is what they had, who would you... I don't you know what? I don't think it was intentional, though, I, the, 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 the source camp. I don't think it was as intentional I, as you I, believe it was. Uh, well, no, Harris is on record as saying that he just absolutely hated having to revisit that. So he did everything in his power what? to prevent that from ever happening again. And there's stuff in there. I mean, uh, honestly, you want to see who the perfect director at the time should have been was Tim Burton. It's, Actually, you know, because if that was the direction that they were going to go yes. into, it, it, they should have gotten someone like you know, Terry Gilliam or someone, well, you know. And, well, Steven Zellian yeah. and David Mantle were wise to cut out some of the plots in the original story because I read the book and I, I was just like dumbfounded. Gary Oldman's because uh, the Gary the Oldman sister. character, yeah, Gary mm. Oldman's character, somehow he could not have, have children or mm. something. And his sister uh, was, um, was a lesbian. And so, you know, they had like an estate. Well, she was cut out of the will, but the only way that they could uh, get the money, her and her lesbian lover, was for her to have a male heir. So the only way to do that was to get Gary Oldman semen. So they try to, they electrocute him with a cattle prod to get his semen to artificially impregnate the, the girlfriend. That's how ridiculous it is to get a male heir. And then, and oh then. Oh my God. I, yeah. I hope, but, but honestly. That is true. I hope your recounting of the Hannibal novel is as accurate as your recounting of Frankenstein. That's, oh, no, I, I'm just, no. that's why I'm kind of like, I'm a no, no. little, little little worried here. No, no, that's, that is true. Okay, a another little one. worried. Right. Also, in the in the book, uh, Hannibal Lecter and Clarice Starling do have a love affair, which I think is totally betrayed. That's what Jodie Foster talked about betraying the character. It's it, it doesn't. They kind of. But there's a sexual affair. Play with that just a little bit. They flirt with that idea. I mean, you get more of an idea that Hannibal Lecter is falling in love with her than she is with him. This one was a very big success. It made a lot of money. In fact, I mean, it was at the time it was the highest grossing R-rated movie of the week, you know, weekend opening ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me tell you, I remember it was sold out, and it took a while to see it, but I was wanting to see it just like everyone else because the hype was there. Well. Of course, they wanted another Hannibal Lecter project, but they didn't want to wait for Thomas Harris to write another book. So Dito De Laurentiis decided to go, hey, we happen to have Manhunter here. Why don't we go back and uh, call it Red Dragon, the original title, and, and refilm it, and let's beef up uh, Hannibal Lecter's role in it this time. Yeah. Well, and that which, you know what, is not a bad idea, because, I mean, it's, a, it's probably the best of all the books. And uh, he had unlimited resources. I mean, he cast some very good actors. Ray Fiennes, who's a very good actor. Yeah, fantastic cast. Great Absolutely. cast. Yeah, but Edward then, Norton. who but, do you think but, would be the it? perfect choice for the to direct this? Exactly. Everything <laughs> Brett is freaking Ratner. Now, this is the proof to me why Brett Ratner is an absolute hack, where you can look at his, this film and you can go, it looks competent. It has good actors in it, it has a good screenplay, but it fails at all levels. And that is because the captain of the ship is incompetent. Well, I, to be fair, I don't think it fails at all levels. What I, my, my feeling about Red Dragon is that it, 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 there's nothing inspired about the approach no, to the film. nothing. Which no. is unfortunate, mm -hmm. and, and because it's a great novel. And Manhunter is a thousand times better, and, and Michael Mann took a lot more liberties with this, the subject matter with Manhunter than they did with Red Dragon, with the exception of expanding uh, Hannibal Lecter's part. But it's just an, uh, it's not a bad film. It's probably Brett Ratner's best movie. That's because of the people who but, are working with him. But it's and still, and still he has, films. he doesn't make any significant stylistic stamp on the subject matter. The it only, could have been directed by anybody. Well, yeah, and the yeah. only thing of note uh, that he, I guess stylistically that he does put in it, is uh, Edward Norton's blonde highlights because his character supposedly lives in a beach community, so he said his hair would be lighter. That's about it. And the only reason Edward Norton even agreed to be in this film was so he could use the money to finance the 25th hour. And also, the detective story doesn't work. It's not really well told. In the original movie, you know, when William Peterson, the way he, uh, just to remind people, the way that the, the Will Graham would get into, get into the character's head uh, to figure out mysteries, would he really get in the character's head and think like a serial killer? You, and, you know, he would look at the pictures, and you would see the emotional trauma that he would go to. And that's what made Manhunter work so well. 
I never felt that with Edward Norton. I never felt that he went through this trauma. They also, it was too, um, didn't leave enough to the imagination in terms of Oh, they of spell like, everything they literally spell out They spell everything for literally you. out. What was great about the first Manhunter, that call it cold or whatever, or dated in that A's way, it spoke, you knew that there wasn't something right about the, the uh, Agent Graham character. You know, you didn't need to know you didn't need to be shown all this exposition about him confronting, you know, Hannibal Lecter and all that stuff. That was already it, 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 volumes was said in very little, and this one it was just an excuse to give Anthony Hopkins more screen time. One uh, thing we missed: uh, the only actor who was in all four films, Frankie, Frankie Faison. Faison. Yeah. Oh, really? And, yes, he plays Barney. Know. That's funny. I did not. Know he that. He's, he's, plays yeah. the same character. He were, he, he, he's, he's the, the black orderly who's like, oh, I know Mr. So he was a manhunter. Yes. yes, he was a manhunter. Different he was part. the cop. Um, what was it? The cop who uh, oh, sends right. Will Bram the. Oh, so was it a text? Or what was it back then? A fax? Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. He's a very good actor. Been around a long time. He's okay. also in Coming to America, a very funny scene. Oh, but, um, so yeah, but uh, the problem is, like I said, it reminds me a lot of Canon films where the, you know, the Canon guys would throw all this money there and they get the, they get the best of the best, but for somehow it just would not come together. And the reason it does not come together is because the director. Brett Ratner does not know how to it's tell It's a story. very unremarkable movie. As Eric said, uh, Thomas Harris did not want to write another sequel to Sansa Lambs, but for some reason, when uh, Dino De Laurentiis said to him, hey, why don't you do a prequel to the whole series of how Hannibal Lecter became Hannibal Lecter, somehow he actually got inspired and actually tried to write a good movie or a good book, and the movie came out, and it bombed really pretty hard you know, at the box office. I... I admire a lot of the movies, but I think Eric is going to agree with me. Why does the story need to be told? We well, why does the story need to be told? But Money. Also, you Money. know, I, it's, it's not like Hamble Lecter was a franchise character to begin with, if you really think about it. But, and, and you, know what, you know what, Hannibal Rise, I caught it on cable. It was on cable the night, so I was like, sure, I'll check it out. And it reminds me of... You know how you'd have like something like like the Highlander movies, like the first one. Everyone loves the first one. Then the sequel came out and it was awful. And eventually they did a TV series, which was really good in the beginning. And then to save money, they shot it all in like Montreal or Quebec or something like that with a pseudo international cast. But you felt that made for TV. That's what Hannibal Rising feels like. It feels like the Europeanized version of a TV version of what was a, uh, started a, 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 on the big screen in the first place. If this wasn't written by Thomas Harris, I would just say it was a rip-off of a cash-in on, on a Hannibal Lecter movie. It's not even, it's, it's just there's a lot of weird things about it, too. It's like the, the, the actor who plays the young Hannibal Lecter, you're kind of like, I, it was, so Hannibal Lecter had an accent at one time, and you know how do you tie that into later? How do you get rid of you know like little things? It's, it's just like kind of bug you, and it shouldn't, but it just does. And and, and the story is not it's not really a, an interesting story. There's no t real twists there or anything like that. I do like a lot of the actors though. I love Gong Li. I think she's very good as Lady Morawski. Um, I don't care. I, I just, I mean, I feel like I'm watching like an extended take, you know, because they are going to do a Hannibal Lecter TV series. Oh, folks. yes, I heard about that. How can the fuck can you do the a best, show? That's what they've announced that, and this felt to me Ugh. like an extended episode of a television version of the Hannibal Lecter movie series. That's what it felt like to me. And I will say one thing that annoyed the living shit out of me. If you look at the poster for Hannibal Rising, which I know Eric will throw a picture up there for us, they have a picture of him with this mask. They wrote this scene in a movie where he sees this, this mask on a display stand. He goes, ooh, looks. He puts it on for like a few seconds and then takes it off. They obviously put that in there to tie it in with Sansa Lance because there is no point at all that this man needs to wear this gothic-looking mask. Anyway, that will bring this show to a close. I'm Edwin Samuelson. We hope you'll follow us on Twitter. We hope that you'll uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, unfinished Business. Unfinished Business. Unfinished business. We have B1 un on Twitter There's also and a Facebook page. Yes, Facebook mm -hmm. page for Unfinished Business. Make sure you Television. follow that, too. Television. Unfinished Business business television and unfinished business productions go. and don't forget yeah. please share comment and uh share the show on your facebook walls and spread the word we want to get it out there and we need your help yeah. anyway i'm edwin samuelson we hope you enjoyed the show and uh Darius. we'll see you later i'll eat your liver with some fava beans and a nice chianti <laughs> all right okay.